Hello, this is a slideshow on the concept of wayfinding. The content of this slideshow will be a section on definitions. It will have a section examining wayfinding as a complete system. It will briefly review text.guidelines dot guidelines for wayfinding markers in the state right away. It will go over some different classes of wayfinding markers. It will examine branding your community with wayfinding markers, gateway markers. I will show some examples briefly go over the planning process for wayfinding, and then conclude with a summary. First, definitions. Wayfinding means knowing where you are, knowing your destination, following the best route, recognizing your destination, and finding your way back. Wayfinding is the art and science of using landmarks, signage, pathways, and environmental cues to help visitors navigate and experience a site without confusion. Wayfinding is not just about signs. Wayfinding is not a one-sign-fits-all approach. Wayfinding can communicate a story. A good wayfinding system allows people to determine their location within a setting, determine their destination, develop a plan to get to their destination. A good wayfinding system will help visitors to your community answer the questions of where am I, where am I going, and how do I get there. Important. Good wayfinding is a complete system or network of elements. A well-designed wayfinding system should identify and mark spaces within your community, group spaces, and link and organize spaces through architectural and graphic means. Complete wayfinding systems have five elements. These are paths, which can be roads, sidewalks, or some other linkage within your community that people use to travel. Edges, which are the boundaries between districts or also city limits, etc. Nodes, which are going to be intersections or centers of economic activity. Districts, which are some area of your community identifiable by a certain characteristic or characteristics. And then markers, which could be wayfinding elements, they could be buildings, they could be architectural cues, they could be geographic features, or even vegetation and landscaping. It is important to consider pathways, edges, nodes, districts, and transportation modality when considering the placement and manner of wayfinding markers. Wayfinding is part of a complete system. Kevin Lynch, a famous urban planner and author, coined the term wayfinding back in the 1960s in a series of books he wrote. His principles for effective wayfinding were create a unique identity at each location, use landmarks to provide orientation cues in memorable locations, create well-structured paths, create regions of differing visual character, don't give the user too many choices in navigation, give navigators maps and survey views, provide signs at decision points to help wayfinding decisions, and use sight lines to show what's ahead. Next, we're going to examine some guidelines from the Texas Department of Transportation for the placement of wayfinding markers in the state right-of-way. TxDOT prescribes that wayfinding signage should be a systematic network of directional signs installed and maintained by a city to guide the traveling public to major civic, cultural, visitor, and recreational destinations. It should be done with a minimum number of signs. A geographic region's most prominent features and assets should be called out and promoted, but only as required to guide visitors. Essentially, TxDOT wants to encourage communities to avoid cluttering the right-of-way. This can be a safety hazard. TxDOT offers some basic wayfinding design guidelines. These are first, the bottom portion of vehicular directional signs should be rectangular in shape. Pictographs should be shown only within the enhancement marker, which is the top of the sign. We'll see some examples of creative sign tops later in the presentation. The bottom portion should have only one background color. Certain colors are prohibited. For example, red is used in stop signs, yellow is used in school crossing. So this is a safety issue. Standardized and minimum font sizes apply. It should be highly legible. TxDOT also offers guidelines for ground supports and mountings. There are different classes of wayfinding markers. The first example here is an automobile marker uh, from Colorado Springs. This is a gateway entrance marker to the community. Notice it evokes themes of the mountains and it also has certain southwestern pastel colors decorating it. Next is an automobile marker appropriate for a local street. This one could also be viewed by pedestrians. And here's an example 
of where the bottom portions are rectangular, but the top has that curved feature to it. So that would fit the TxDOT guidelines, and that's from Bentonville, Arkansas. And finally, here's an example of a pedestrian kiosk wayfinding marker that's creatively placed around a street sign pole. Wayfinding features must be appropriately sized, designed, and placed so as to be legible and conspicuous to the desired user. Automobile scale includes wayfinding markers for highway, collector, and local routes. These would obviously be of different sizes with different kinds of fonts and different designs based upon where you were going to put them. Next is a multimodal marker. And this here on the right is appropriate for both automobiles traveling at a slower rate of speed and for pedestrians and bicyclists. And finally, we have pedestrian markers, which are too small to be read by cars, and these can be creatively placed on street poles. This next slide illustrates a wayfinding marker that is nearly illegible to the desired user. The symbol and text size are too small. Also, if you notice, the color doesn't stand out against the background. Furthermore, if the goal is to communicate, the placement here is problematic. We have a wildlife viewing trail's location number, which corresponds to a map that TPWD sells. The issue here, though, is where are people supposed to pull over? There's a driveway for a local strip center and really nothing else at this location. It's possible that the marker was there first and the strip center was added later. Another thing here is that the brown color does not really stand out against the cluttered background. Here is a closer view of the marker. So when designing wayfinding markers, it's important to consider the user. Are they going to be traveling at 50 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour, or is it going to be people walking? In this case here, there's not even a sidewalk or really an effective bike lane. Text size is important to consider. Notice you can barely read it. The symbol is important as well. Placement is critical, and color, once again, is extremely important. A best practice when considering the color for wayfinding markers is to choose colors that are easily describable. You run into problems when somebody calls to tell their friend uh, the sort of brownish off-colored sign or perhaps the orangish sign, etc. It's much better if somebody can say the blue signs downtown guide you to the restaurants to go to or the purple signage, etc. Something that stands out and is unique. And here's an example of a wildlife viewing marker that's more appropriate for vehicles traveling at a high rate of speed. Notice the large binocular symbol and the much larger font. An integrated wayfinding system provides an opportunity to establish a community brand. Brand is the name, term, design, symbol, or any other feature that identifies one seller's good or services as distinct from those of other sellers. It is important to consider that our community, like many others, is competing in a free market of communities. There are countless cities, towns, boroughs, villages, and counties, and choices for people to move to. In that sense, our community can be seen as a product on this market of places to live, and a brand, a symbol, is a way to differentiate your community from others. A brand is the most valuable fixed asset of a corporation. Gateways and wayfinding are ways of branding a community that tell a coherent story to visitors. Brand identities are protected at great cost by businesses and public and private entities. When having a discussion in a community about implementing a wayfinding system, it's also helpful to have a conversation about the message that you wish to convey to visitors and also potential future citizens Okay, this next slide begins with a formula. Heritage plus aspirations equal brand. It is important to be unique and authentic. Wayfinding system is an opportunity to tell our story. Many brand logos slash slogans, like adages, are cliche but still good because they resonate and are true. A good example of an adage would be something like everything is bigger in Texas. It's cliche, but it's used to promote the state. And on the right here is a picture of an I Walk New York marker, which is a play, of course, on the iconic I Love New York logo. Lately, I've been enjoying a show on AMC called Mad Men. The show is about advertising executives in the 1960s. The character here on the right is Don Draper, and he's the protagonist of the television show. His character was based upon a real-life advertising pioneer named Rosser Reeves, who was a pioneer of television advertising. He believed that to be effective, advertising must be honest could not move inferior goods, could not create demand where none existed, should focus on a unique selling proposition, 
and would be a waste of money to claim uniqueness that didn't exist because consumers would soon find out. All of this could apply to a community when branding with a wayfinding system. A good brand logo can answer essential questions potential visitors may have. The best brands convey a message or arouse curiosity. And here are some local examples. And on the left, we have Round Rock, Texas, Purpose, Passion, Prosperity. Above that and to the right, there's Pflugerville, where quality meets life. And then below that, Visit Rally. Examples are fairly generic brand logos for communities that can appear on their wayfinding markers and also on their web pages and, of course, letterhead. Sometimes the purpose is to be generic, and that's okay because some of these cases we're saying, hey, this is a bedroom community or this is a suburb and it's a safe place to live. It's predictable. Other communities try to forge a brand identity to differentiate themselves from other communities. Here's an example of a rustic wayfinding marker that tells a story. It says, Dripping Springs, Gateway to the Hill Country. Next is an example from Wichita Falls. It says, Blue Skies, Golden Opportunities. What is clever about this is it includes the iconic shapes of Texas and the star, but does it in such a way as to show you the location or answer the question of where Wichita Falls is. The placement of the star is clever, and this logo tells a story. This next example is from downtown Fort Worth, and it says Fort Worth Stockyards. You can say go big or go home in Texas. This is an example of taking a downtown urban space, and they're also trying to tell a story and reinforce that brand image. Obviously, the people there know they're in the Fort Worth Stockyards, but notice how somebody else driving through, a visitor in the community, maybe during the daytime, wouldn't know that this is an area of nightlife and vibrant. What they are doing here with this is reinforcing the notion of a district. All right, this next one is one of my personal favorites. This is Amarillo, and it says, Step into the Real Texas. Notice that not only does it tell a bit of a story, but they also, with the imagery, have played upon Texas' iconic themes, in this case, cowboy boots, the Western heritage, and they've incorporated that cleverly in their logo. You'll notice that this logo not only appears on their webpage, notice that the logo is also trademarked, they protect this identity for their brand, but it appears on things like the overpasses and gateway markers within the community. So it's reinforced throughout the city of Amarillo. Next, we have Cedar Park Conserves. It tells you something about what values are important to the residents of Cedar Park. Fast Drop has an interesting community brand. They really build upon their most prominent features, which are the river and, of course, the famous pine trees. So here it says, Bastrop, Texas, Heart of the Lost Pines, established 1832. So there's a bit of a history lesson and also a bit of a geography lesson inherent in this brand. This next local example is from Hutto, Texas. It says, Growing a Quality Community, and then once again, we got a bit of a history lesson. Something interesting here is that many communities in Texas, unlike maybe Colorado or Wyoming or even California, they don't have mountains or very tall features to help differentiate them visually. We call this placemaking. So what Hutto builds on here are these grain elevators. There's these three prominent grain elevators when you drive into the community, and they've actually incorporated that in their logo. Might be something to consider in a place like Lockhart, where we have a prominent grain elevator when we drive into town, as well as the famous courthouse. And the question is, would you pay $4 per gallon of gas to visit Pearland? City of Pearland. And there we see industry, technology, and pears. Or Lukenbach, Texas. Once again, that star is a bit overused. This next logo is Waxahachie, and it's got a lot of things going on. I'm not sure what the flower is, if it's cotton or that's a crepe myrtle, but the slogans are crepe myrtle capital and then gingerbread city. And then also we have an image of what looks like a prominent courthouse. And next are a series of iconic brands. We have Denver, which is the Mile High City, so you get the brand and the slogan. Don't mess with Texas. Famous, famous, internationally recognized. I love New York. Wyoming's license plate, Florida's license plate, and then a host of corporate and private brands around the edges here. Everything from 20th Century Fox to Starbucks to McDonald's, BMW, Apple, etc. These are iconic brands. What is telling about this slide is that communities, cities, states are competing upon this market with brands in much the same way that private industry is doing. Gateways are the first impressions people have of your community. They are community entrance landmarks scaled for highway motorists traveling at a high rate of speed. They must communicate information quickly. In addition to communicating a place's name, gateway landmarks can answer questions such as, why should I pull over at this place? What is unique about it? 
What distinguishes it from other places? What is its story? They provide a great opportunity for you to brand your community and differentiate it from others. Think of it as your community reaching out to motorists traveling at 70 miles an hour, convincing them why they should pull over and spend money. Here's an example of Pueblo. Notice that we have here a gateway landmark. Tells you the name of the community. It also has got some Southwest imagery and themes present. And then it says the Home of Heroes, Congressional Medal of Honor. So it's giving you a bit of the story of the military heritage of Pueblo. There's a lot of military bases in that area, Southern Colorado. All right, the next is an attractive gateway marker from Rockdale, Texas. I'm not sure what the story is here, but it is different looking than many gateway monuments. It prominently features cut stones in obvious reference to the name Rockdale. Well, they say everything is bigger in Texas, but perhaps not in this case. We have the Gateway Monument from St. Louis, Missouri. This is internationally recognized, and it's possibly the ultimate gateway marker. It's called the Gateway Arch, in fact, and it signifies the gateway to the west or the Great Plains. Finally, we have Round Rock's brand new gateway landmark, which is prominently featured in the I-35 right-of-way. It's about halfway complete right now, so it's currently under construction. It's important when considering implementing a wayfinding system to avoid the common misconceptions. First, many people think we just need a few signs. Wayfinding is not about building a few signs. Second, many people think we already know where the signs should go. Placement without purpose will lead to confusion. You can have a great marker or sign, but put it in the wrong place and it's going to be ineffective. The wayfinding planning process includes the following steps. First, identify a need. Then, establish a clear system goal. Once you have a goal and a need, then you can create a focal point for that system. And this is where we're trying to direct visitors to go. Then develop a complete vision for that system. Remember, it's not just a sign. It's not just placing at one location. It's a entire system. Then finally, you must be able to clearly communicate the completed vision to visitors. Here are some real world examples. On this slide, we have a kiosk type marker placed around a street pole. This is obviously geared towards pedestrians. It reinforces what it says textually with a map. On the right, once again, another kiosk similar to what you might see at the outlet mall or retail center directing pedestrian traffic around a city district. And you'll notice there's a map also. It's also simple. It's not really cluttered. It doesn't have a lot of information. It's just got a few things. Here are some creative examples. And these were from a site that had award-winning wayfinding markers. Notice that buildings and architectural cues are included. So here we have subway marked on the bricks of a building. And on the left, these are buttons. What's interesting about these buttons placed on this building is that they communicate information in a language neutral way. In other words, you don't have to speak whichever language this is to understand that you can take pictures from the top floor and that there's some sort of coffee and probably restaurants to be had at the bottom level. This next slide are some examples of wayfinding markers appropriate for both pedestrians and automobiles. An interesting feature of the marker at the top right is there is a yellow cylinder on top of the pole featuring a person walking. So this is reinforcement that the person walking probably from an earlier sign or marker is on the correct path to get to some destination. Right, here are some creative examples. We see rocks or stones that are illustrated with, pic with pictograph markers. Very simple, it's creative, but it could be effective. On the bottom right, and this is something that retailers have been exploring for several years now, is placing information at your feet. So we have wayfinding in three dimensions here. And on the left are some rather busy and colorful looking uh, spires. Here's an example of a wayfinding marker for a parking garage that's designed to look like a old movie theater sign. And on the right, a good example of using color to differentiate the wayfinding marker from its background. Here's a blue one. Another thing that's interesting about this one is it's placed at a node. So you'll see that it's viewable from different directions. People coming from one path can read it, and people coming from another path can read it. So it's got different facets of information. And here's another kiosk with a map. Then here's an example of a map that is placed on a building or a wall. 
it's an interesting creative use of space as well. So it's not just a freestanding sign, but it's integrated into the built environment. And a new trend is this three-dimensional view of a city, which is reflective of what people see on their smartphones. All right, this next example is a local example from Georgetown, Texas. This is their wayfinding and signage master plan. It is a systems approach, and it's from 2005. It, the document is available online, and obviously has too much information to convey in a brief slideshow, but I will draw attention on some of the markers and how they're integrated in a system. All right, first is a high-speed gateway monument. This is an entry feature to their community designed to be viewable by motorists traveling at over 50 miles per hour, probably along I-35. It's appropriately scaled for motorists traveling at a high rate of speed, and it uses site-specific landscaping. Here's a vehicle directional marker. This was the one that was in that picture at the, earlier on in the presentation. It's appropriately scaled for vehicles traveling at lower rates of speed. It's used to direct vehicular traffic along major arteries. It should be limited to generic destinations like shopping instead of specific businesses. It has space for just four messages. Use shorter messages whenever possible. This is a safety concern. Furthermore, if a sign is cluttered, it's not going to be successful in communicating a message. Here's a trailblazer marker, and this is small enough to be placed on street poles or utility poles or even buildings. It may be mounted on existing streetscape elements. It's a single destination marker such as post office or city park. It's a sign conveying one message. And here is a pedestrian scale marker. It provides orientation and listings for visitor destinations. It's located at major pedestrian routes and placed on paved surfaces. It's tended to be double faced and located within planting areas along pedestrian routes. Next are interpretive markers, and these are used to identify significant buildings or events. Uh, they are tended to be single-faced and located within planted areas. And here's an example of a vehicle directional marker in Georgetown, Texas. Notice the four categories, and then they've kind of creatively used the middle one to show you recreational opportunities at the park. And here in Georgetown, we have the creative placement of interpretive marker that's located down at your feet in the pedestrian space. It's worked into the brickwork, and it this is less cluttered than if they had a marker standing straight up blocking that bench. It's worked into the existing streetscape environment. This next slide it shows a complete series of wayfinding markers or a system from Decatur, Alabama. It seems a bit busy and there's a bit many different kinds of markers to detect a, a theme here. But nevertheless, you can see the rectangular bottoms with the different features on top and it covers everything from banners to small fixtures that go on top of existing stop signs and street signs. Okay, in summary, wayfinding is not just about erecting signs, it is about having a complete system for directing visitors. You must first identify your need, then find a focal point in the planning process. You then create a plan. The plan should be holistic, thematic, and consistent. Wayfinding is an opportunity to tell your story. You can forge a brand identity for your community. How are you different from other places? How are you alike other places? Why should people visit your community? Why should people move to your community? And here are the references used for this slideshow. I hope you've enjoyed this brief presentation on wayfinding. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm.